Shalom. Thank you for joining me. Tonight, my topic is a total eclipse of the sun, S-O-N. Yesterday, August 21st, 2017, there was a total eclipse of the sun, S-U-N. It was monumental <clears throat> in many respects, first of which was the fact that the path of totality in which the solar eclipse could be viewed as a total solar eclipse included the entirety of the continental United States, a path that extended from Oregon to the coast of South Carolina. Just a couple of hours ago, before speaking, as I was thinking about what I would speak about tonight, as I do nearly every week before I speak, I exited my office and went for a walk, which I often do, and uh, my office is located about one block from the Gulf of Mexico, where there is a long causeway that juts over the Gulf, very beautiful walk, and I went there on my usual four-mile walk today along the causeway, and I note that here on the Florida Gulf Coast, by the way, we had only a partial eclipse. It was about 75%, but it was quite remarkable. And I thought, as I viewed it yesterday, yesterday afternoon, you know, what an amazing thing. You know, that was actually the first time I'd ever uh, actually viewed a solar eclipse. And at the same time, I was going inside to view it on CNN, where the full eclipse was being broadcast from places in the path of totality like Hopkinsville, Kentucky. And quite frankly, uh, there was so much publicity and talk about this one that I took the time to watch it and follow it on the news because it really seemed like a big deal. And I have to say, there is something quite remarkable about a total solar eclipse or even a partial one. Therefore, uh, this idea about the solar eclipse has really been on my mind, and I've noticed that it's been on the mind of a lot of people right now, especially in America, where the path of it went from coast to coast. And so, as I went on my walk, it was really occupying my thoughts, and uh, as I walked along the causeway under the bright beaming, and I note quite hot, Florida sun. And I think, um, you know, what, what it is about the eclipse that makes such an indelible impact is that, well, there's something humbling about it because it's such a vivid illustration. It's such a profound demonstration that the universe in which we live is indeed governed by a higher intelligence. Now, I know, of course, for the billions of people in the world who believe in God, <clears throat> myself included, you know, we would never refute that anyway. We would always affirm that the universe is not some random thing, but it's created and governed by a higher intelligence, i.e. God. And yet, there's something so moving, so profound about a moment in which this is illustrated you know, there's one thing about, or excuse me, it's one thing to believe in God. It's another to actually be conscious, to actually know, and to actually bear witness to something that is really irrefutably the hand of God, who has set the cosmos in order, is, is something that is really beyond belief because it's a moment just like when that diamond ring appears when totality hits and then there's this corona around the sun. It's this moment where it's it's an aha moment. It's ah! And there's just a moment of consciousness in which you just know because you're witnessing it with your own eyes that there is indeed a God who has set all this up even though you already believe it. Normally you can't see it. But it's a hidden thing. 
and then suddenly you see it, and it's profound, it's indelible, it makes a mark. And imagine the millions and millions of people who saw this, and it went, it cut a path 70 miles long from Oregon to South Carolina, right across the United States, and it, it has caused a lot of people to prophesy. Many are prophesying doom and destruction. Others are prophesying blessings. I stay away from that. That's not where I'm coming from right now. But I encourage you to look into it. There's plenty out there and uh, go on. Google it. <laughs> search it out. That's just not my thing. That's not where I'm coming from tonight. But, you know, the sun is something we normally take for granted. It's there. It goes up and down. But suddenly it goes dark in the middle of the day. And it just reminds you that there's one who created the heavenly bodies and set them in their perfect order according to plan and reason and purpose and history, including the history of humanity and even the history of the cosmos, is linear. Everything is rotating and circling out there in the heavens. But history is not cyclical, it's linear. We are headed for a set time. We are headed towards a set destination. Ye shall be changed, and this world shall be changed. There is a new creation in Messiah Yeshua, and individually we are that new creation, and when Messiah Yeshua returns, there indeed will be a new humanity, one new humanity, and a new heavens and a new earth. It was witnessed by the Jewish prophets of old and recorded in the Tanakh, and Yeshua spoke of it, as did many of his Talmudim, his disciples. Indeed, there are many who see the eclipse as a sign, and as I said, I'm familiar with many of these details, and I prefer uh, not to get into that. But I would encourage you to look into it yourselves. And there are many different ideas about uh, what kind of sign, if any, it could be. But I'll say this. In the book of Matthew, we know this. It's recorded twice. Two times. That when Yeshua was challenged about signs, you know, the Pharisees would say, show us a sign. And sometimes I think what they meant by that was, um, you know, do something like turn these stones into bread. Or, but other times I think what they meant was uh, to prophesy, predict something, and we'll see if it comes to pass. Because that's how you prove that you're a prophet, right? Well, he wasn't fixing to do that. And so when he was challenged, and there are two times in Matthew 12, verse 38, as well as Matthew 16, 4. I'm just reading from Matthew 12 here. Some of the Torah scholars and Pharisees said, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But Yeshua replied to them, An evil and adulterous generation clamors for a sign, yet no sign shall be given to it except the sign of Jonah the prophet. Again, no sign shall be given except the sign of Jonah. What did he mean by that? He meant, look, you know, if there are signs at all, then don't worry about predicting the future. But worry about this, that just as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for three days and nights, so the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. And so he's referring to his own death and resurrection, which was a sign. And even as the Queen of Sheba came from Ethiopia all the way up to Jerusalem to hear the wisdom of Solomon, something greater than Solomon is here. And so when it comes to signs, if there are signs, then the question arises, a sign, if, the, if it's a sign, then what to do about it? That's the question what to do about it if it is a sign. If the solar eclipse is a sign, for example, what are we supposed to do about it? A sign of what? And here it is. Just like the sign of Jonah. 
the men of Nineveh, repented. They turned to God. They made teshuvah. Teshuvah means repentance, but literally it means return to God from the root shuv, teshuvah, return to Hashem. So this is to say that the signs that we might even see in the heavens in our generation is to do what? Is to look to Messiah. What are we supposed to do? If we see signs in the heavens, predict the future? I can't sit here and tell you what the solar eclipse means. There are many who are saying it means judgment upon America because it went across the whole continent. And that hasn't happened for like 99 years. And there are others who are saying it means a blessing. And, and there are a lot of people are saying it, it means judgment because the rabbis of old used to say that a solar eclipse means judgment upon the nations, whereas a lunar eclipse means judgment upon Israel. And you know, when the blood moons happened a few years back, everybody was saying that, but nothing happened. Nothing out of the ordinary. I think all of this is a sign that we're supposed to repent. The world should see these things and and have that aha moment. That aha moment that says, oh, there is a God. And even though I already believe it, now I see it. And so it causes me to make Teshuvah to return to God because at that moment I know, not just believe, but I know that he's real and that his scriptures are true. Moreover, isn't it interesting that this solar eclipse happened at the new moon? Just as the sun was going down in Jerusalem, the solar eclipse began to touch Salem, Oregon. That first point of contact with the continental U.S. At the, at the very precise moment that the sun went down in Jerusalem, the eclipse began at Salem, Oregon. That's a pretty amazing thing. And it was the new moon. And not just a new moon, but a new moon is the new month, but the month of Elul has begun. Now, what's the big deal about that? Well, the month of Elul is a month of repentance, which traditionally is to prepare us, to prepare our hearts through introspection and special slichot services, which means forgiveness. It's a time of checking ourselves and and making teshuvah to prepare ourselves for that great and awesome day known as Yom Din, the day of judgment, which is represented by Rosh Hashanah, which is at the beginning of the next month. So Elul is an entire month of preparing ourselves for the next month, which is the high holidays, beginning with Rosh Hashanah. So, you know, if only we knew how <laughs> to make Tishuvah, if only we knew how. And it, in the, the nutshell version, I'll tell you this. Join ourselves to the Lord. That's what it really is. It's not rites and rituals or special prayers or even confessing, although there's a reason why we do all that, but when something happens within ourselves and the heart is joined back to God, that's Teshuvah. It's a return to God because most of the time the human being is going in this direction, outward, 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 usually with a sword in our hand. But when we get introspective and look within ourselves wherein the Messiah dwells as he taught us abide in me and I will abide in you then there's this communion that goes on and you know if there's a time to do that every day is good but a special time is the month of Elul and add that add to that that there's a solar eclipse that just happened that might be a sign of impending doom and judgment upon planet earth or particular nations i'm not saying that it is but it could be and but either way there's something about it that causes you to 
stand in awe, in humility before the Lord. And it's amazing and it's so cool that millions and millions of people are feeling that way right now. So as I was finishing my walk today, with the sun bearing down upon me, uh, as I was thinking about how could this bright sun in the sky suddenly just disappear into a dark shadow, as it did yesterday, and what does this mean, etc. And I suddenly got this word from the inner voice, the still small voice within, which said to me, total eclipse of the sun. And that I knew needed to be not only the title of tonight's message, which quite frankly, I had no idea what I was going to talk about tonight until I took this walk. But then I came down, uh, I came back down into my office and and determined uh, what I was going to say to you tonight. And uh, and this is this is what the Lord put on my heart. And um, total eclipse of the sun. Maybe you're sitting there thinking, okay, I still don't know what he means by that. And by total eclipse of the sun, it was S-O-N. I saw it. Not S-U-N, but S-O-N. That sun. And so, what am I talking about? Well, here's what it is. And I suddenly, when I got that word, I suddenly remembered the verse that I was reading this morning on my back porch as I enjoyed a cup of some of the most delicious coffee, which I picked up in Canada last weekend. I was in Toronto last weekend. Something called Tim Hortons. Uh, up there, they just call it Timmy's. <laughs> and it's really good coffee, so I encourage you, highly recommend it. And I was reading over some Tim Hortons coffee, a verse from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It begins at verse 2, and here's what it says. I was reading it this morning. So it all connected together when I got that word. It says, don't get shaken out of your mind or disturbed, either by a spirit or a word or a letter, as if through us, as though the day of the Lord has come. Let me stop there. So this is Paul talking, and he's saying, don't get freaked out about what people are saying as if Yom Din is at hand, which is the day of judgment, or Yom Adonai, which is the day of the Lord, which, by the way, is what Rosh Hashanah is called in Jewish tradition. And you'll see it throughout the Machzor, the Jewish High Holiday Prayer Book, that again and again, Rosh Hashanah and also Yom Kippur, which is 10 days later, is called Yom Din, Yom Adonai, the day of the Lord, because it's always been believed by the Jews that that would be the day that the Messiah would come the son of David, to judge the earth and set up the throne to rule as Lord of Lords and King of Kings over all the earth. And the Jewish people are right about that. Just the only thing is that it isn't the first time he comes. It's the second time. Don't get disturbed, Paul said. You know, because in that generation, they thought he was coming back any minute. And... But they were constantly, you know, sort of advised against that, against living that way. He says, let no one deceive you in any way, for the day will not come unless the rebellion comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the one destined to be destroyed. He opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he sits in the temple of God, proclaiming himself that he is God. So, in other words, the day of the Lord's not going to come. Yeshua's not going to come back until first there's this rebellion and this so-called um, man of lawlessness, who's also in other scriptures called the anti-Messiah or anti-Christ, until he is, uh, until he sets himself up as a god in the earth, even sitting in the temple of God, proclaiming himself that he is God. So until that happens, it ain't happening, and that hadn't happened. So don't freak out and think that the day of the Lord is at hand until that happens. That's what he's saying. 
And so um, an individual will rise to power somehow and proclaim himself to be God. And there'll be this rebellion and, and all this. And, and, uh, and that's when, after that, then the Lord will come back. And, and so, whatever you might hear, whatever signs that there might be in the heavens or in the earth, don't be shaken, because until that happens, it isn't time yet. And in any case, the signs that we do see in the heavens or in the earth can only mean to us one thing. Not trying to predict the future, but repent. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Isn't that exactly what Messiah Yeshua taught again and again and again? Yes, it is. That's what he taught. That was the message of the kingdom that he taught. And if you read the Gospels, you see him teaching that again and again. That was what he came to preach. He did signs and wonders and miracles and demonstration thereof, and he preached. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And it's the same message for this generation, as close as we might be. And when he comes, when Messiah Yeshua returns, he will judge the earth, and he'll establish a new humanity, a new world, filled with righteousness and peace. And ruled by him as Lord of Lords and King of Kings. But Paul is warning it will not come until first the man of lawlessness is revealed. Now, here's the important part. Because <laughs> I, I keep talking about the total eclipse of the sun, S-O-N, right? So what is it that is keeping that time from coming? What is it that's keeping the lawless one, the, the anti-Messiah that Paul refers to, this, this man who deceives the world to think he's God? What is it that's keeping him from making his move? There's something holding it back. And here's what it is. What's holding it back is the sunshine, S-O-N, the sunshine, S-O-N. Because as long as the sun, S-O-N, is still shining on the earth, it is impossible for the lawless one to make his move. He can't. Hence, what would happen if there were an eclipse? Not partial, but a total eclipse. And not of the sun, S-U-N, but a total eclipse of the sun, S-O-N what would happen if there were that kind of eclipse in the earth. Look what it says in the next verse, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 5. Don't you remember that when I was still with you, I was telling you these things? And you know, you know what now holds back for him to be revealed in his own, in his own time. So Paul is about to say what it is that's holding him back. For the mystery of lawlessness is already operating. Only there is one who holds it back right now until he is taken out of the way. Then the lawless one will be revealed. The Lord Yeshua will slay him with the breath of his mouth and wipe him out with the appearance of his coming. So what is it that's holding him back? The sunshine, S-O-N, the sunshine. That's what's holding him back a.k.a. also known as the Ruach HaKodesh, or Holy Spirit. As long as the Holy Spirit is shining on the earth, the enemy, the lawless one, the Antichrist, can't make his move, can't raise himself up in the temple and hold himself out to be God and deceive the world. What, what it will take is a blocking out, a momentary blocking out of the sun, S-O-N, shine, the sunshine. Because the Ruach HaKodesh is holding 
it back. I'm thankful for that. But eclipses do happen, just like they happen with the S-U-N sun. And this is what the scriptures teach. Right now, the Lord Yeshua is seated at the right hand of the majesty on high. We know from Acts 7.55, among other many other verses that say that Yeshua is seated there, when Stephen was about to die, being stoned to death by Paul, just before giving it up, he says, Stephen says, or it's, it says of Stephen, but he, full of the Ruach HaKodesh, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Yeshua standing at the right hand of God. And Stephen said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. That's where Yeshua is. What's he doing at the right hand of God? He's shining forth. He's shining forth the glory. He's shining forth the sunshine, S-O-N, the Ruach HaKodesh. He's interceding. He's sending forth the Ruach. The Ruach, he's, John immersed you in water, but Yeshua immerses his Talmudim in a different kind of immersion the immersion of the Holy Spirit in fire. He stands there, shining forth, and as long as the sun keeps shining, he makes his sun to shine upon the evil and the good. The evil don't know it, but either way, so long as the sun shines, the light of the Son of God holds back the reign of evil from planet Earth. Until one day, like a blip on the radar screen, a total eclipse of the sun, just then, for a flash of history, it will happen. The sun who wears the corona or crown, keter, upon his head will be blocked out by the shadow of darkness. The earth will grow dark for a season. Then the lawless one will be revealed, and then Messiah will return. Be prepared. What is the sign of the eclipse? If it is a sign, it's saying what Yeshua preached all along. This, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Make teshuvah, return to Hashem. The time is at hand. Lila Tov, I appreciate you joining me. You can... If you are so moved, give an online donation at templenj.org. That's templenj.org. Click donations. We definitely need your support and your help. And in this upcoming season, it is a tradition to give high holiday offerings. So we encourage that. You can go online templenj.org. I appreciate you joining me tonight. Shalom Aleichem. Laila Tov.